Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I am joined by my uh, ever esteemed co host, uh, Ricardo Martin. Uh -huh. Um, and potentially uh, by Jerry as well, if he decides to come in halfway through the podcast, um, but also by uh, our fantastic uh, co-founder, Michelle, uh, who is here next to me. Um, and yeah, today we're interviewing uh, the highlights uh, of today's uh, podcast, which is uh, Smuggler, uh, who co-hosts the Cypherpunk Bitstream podcast, uh, founded Anarplex.net, uh, and is a security consultant and overall uh, privacy advocate uh thanks for joining us today uh smuggler it's appreciated um is there anything i've missed out that you want to say in your intro or are you all good uh i'm good and thank you for having me no worries uh, the pleasure is definitely ours um so yeah usually uh as you know if you've seen some other of our pods uh, I, I like to just kind of find out a bit about like uh you know yourself and your mindset uh, as an early person and when you discovered bitcoin things like that just so we can kind of you know, get to understand you a bit better and, and kind of, uh, you know, have an awesome chat. Uh, so I guess my first question for you is, um, how did you begin your journey as a cypherpunk? Uh, was that something that you can kind of, you can see sort of elements of the ideology and the beliefs in, in kind of from, from a young age, or is that something that you kind of come across, came across quite suddenly, or what's kind of like the, the story there, I suppose, if you're uh, willing to tell? Uh, well, it's probably the story of a wasted youth. Um, give a kid a, a computer and trouble might be close. So that's more or less what happened with me. Um, I basically joined the Cypherpunk uh, mailing list in the 90s, late 90s, I think, um, mostly out of interest in the outlaw aspects of uh, technology. Um, I was always fascinated by that. Um, and then it, it just the rest just happened you know you you radicalize you do things um and then 25 years later you're on a podcast with you so i like that answer man. <laughs> i um, i guess like a question is um like how did you how did you first come across bitcoin um and i guess like what well, what went through your mind? Were you one of those people who kind of heard about it, ignored it, heard about it, ignored it, heard about it, went for it? Or was it kind of like an instant click for you? Um, I'm actually not really sure when I stumbled um, over it the, the first time. Um, it probably was in the context of Invisible RC project or Cypherpunk's mailing list or something like that. So somewhere in, in that context. Um, and in the beginning, it was um, technical interest, I guess. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm not the 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 big uh, Bitcoin fanboy, so I, I can't tell you a story of you know being enlightened suddenly. Uh, by Bitcoin and, and believing that the world is going to be fixed by hashtag Bitcoin fixes this. But um, yeah, it was it was relatively early on. And I, I remember the one of the first things I did is I gave a talk at a local libertarian meeting about it. Um, and it was basically about private monies. So um, various different currencies and, and um, gold and silver and Bitcoin. And then I was at a Bitcoin conference in, in London in, in 2012, I think, or in 2011, I can't remember. Um, so, but before that, I already started uh, OTC trading, I think. So, and then for a while, I did a lot of OTC trading. Um, yeah, that's, that's my Bitcoin story. There's not much to it. You know? I'm super curious. I can't, I can't release this until, uh, after you said it. When you said like outlaw technologies, for me as not like a non-dev, it sounds like you're talking about like the sacred words from the secret text or something. But like, <laughs> what's outlaw technologies? So in in the '90s, um, cryptography was still considered ammunition, and doing things with cryptography was a little bit edgy sometimes. And especially the combination of, you know, using the internet and anonymization technologies, cryptography, um, 
there was a certain attraction of uh, interesting characters. Let, let me say that like this. Um, so it's, that is what I'm talking about. You know, it's like early days of anonymity cryptography and still depending on, on how deep the rabbit hole you go, um, I would still consider these technologies uh, highly suspicious. Um, yeah. So basically it's like this thing where they can't find any real world normal use for everyday people. So then it must be something criminal. Is that like the type of uh, feeling? No, it's, it's the, so the, the feeling on our side is more this um, awesome, this is technology and we can use it to, to manipulate the world and, and um, maybe even manipulate power and get away with things that we wouldn't get away with before. So that is, if we don't, one of the big things is with, with computer tech in general is that um, you don't really have to ask anybody for permission. So, you know, you, you break a patent, you, you hack a system, you copy what you want, you know, and so on and so on. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of, um, yeah, it's an outlaw space if you want it to be that. So it's, it's not like uh, building airplanes, you know, which is highly regulated, you know, it's computers in the wrong hands are always creative um, and slightly, um, so slightly questionable. Are you, you're meeting more things like uh, assassination markets and prediction markets and stuff like that, that were kind of like thrown around the cypherpunk mailing list, right? Yeah, though I'm I'm not a big believer in in uh, both of them actually. Uh, so my my focus was on on three things: uh, anonymization technology in general, so uh, remailers uh, at that point mostly. Then uh, data havens is something I found uh, always interesting, and I actually ran a commercial data haven for um, a couple of months until 9/11 happened, and we got a phone call. And um, and of course, untraceable cash. You know, yeah, who doesn't like untraceable digital cash? Um, but I'm more from the. My background is more in in, in cash than in in uh, cryptocurrencies, as they're called today. I just had a quick question. Do you feel that the cypherpunk aspect of crypto has been compromised as regulators and, and hedge funds and investors and stuff have come into the space? Well, the moment people suck up and say, uh, we want to make it a safe space for institutional investors, of course it's compromised. I mean, that's what the punk is for, you know? It's like, no, it's not a safe space for, for suits. Yeah. End of the story. That's a fair answer, man. <laughs> That's a, I like it. Point uh, to the point. Because um, I, I saw that you um, you'd written a white paper. Uh, the name escapes me now. It's really annoying me. Um, for a uh, type of, I think cryptocurrency. Um, oh, it's gonna annoy me. Is it was it script or something? I can't, I can't script. Remember. Yes. Script. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say like I, I guess like uh, where did the idea come from that and like how is that. Um, overall project going like are you working on that like currently presently and like uh pushing that forward like how, how's that going because it seems like quite a big thing to be involved in and kind of like a impressive thing as well so i just wanted to get like uh, some like understanding of you know where that came from what it actually is and like why for example i should use this instead of something like monero maybe if i'm being privacy conscious in the, in the currency space um so yeah i figured a long answer potentially coming from you but i i figured that'd be quite good to, to ask yeah so um script is in a way something very old and something very new at the same time so it's a federated chomian e-cash system so uh chomian e-cash is actually something that was described in the 80s uh in a in a paper by chom and um it is basically the closest thing to cash you can have on a digital, uh, digital platform. Um, it's based on uh, one-time use certificates that are signed um, by a blind signature algorithm, which means that the issuer of such a certificate cannot uh, trace it, cannot follow it. It can only um, check if it exists, uh, if it's valid, basically. And everybody else can do that as well. So you can verify if it's valid. And that means that you have relatively small uh, strings of, of bytes that you can use um, for extremely fast and flexible payment, um, the same as you would use cash. And so that is 
basically one of the first um, real digital, not currencies, but payment system. It's not a currency, it's a, it's a value transfer system. And the issue with Xiaomi uh, and Cash has always been that it's a single issuer system. So it's, it's one party that issues the coins and uh, one car party that can actually um, issue as many coins as they want, nobody would see it. And that is something that has always bugged me. So I, I ran a, a Xiaomi and eCash system um, many, many years ago, uh, backed by gold, uh, was medium successful, um, more a hobby than anything else. And then the one of the things that changed with the widening of the community is that a lot of the previous trust relationships that uh, existed in the how you call it uh, privacy underground or whatever uh, all of that a lot of them didn't scale anymore and with bitcoin they scale and they scale because uh, trust is distributed over many nodes so the idea behind Script is to create uh, a Xiaomi and Ecosystem system that is distributed over many nodes, where uh, those nodes, which are independently run, have to uh, act in consensus with each other to operate um, the payment system. And that is what Script is. It is a federated, um, distributed, untraceable, extremely fast, extremely cheap, extremely flexible, uh, digital payment system and um, it is one of two projects in the field that uh, I know so it's um, I think I talked about script the first time like three years ago at HCPP and then um, a few people came around and they got inspired so by now there's also Fediment which is a, a very similar system um, uses the, the uh, basic idea when it comes to mint infrastructure, they're using a different um, consensus algorithm and they're focusing a lot on making it a layer two for uh, Bitcoin. Um, and for us, it's more like a research project. Um, it's a little bit in the context of the TAZ, um, which is actually one of the first places we, we imagine doing this and mostly for uh, paying for the toilet that we were about to install um, because you want anonymous shitting, right? So yeah, that is where it comes from. And um, why is it better than Monero or whatever? So I wouldn't really use the term better because that really depends on your use case. Um, something like Script is dramatically fast and cheap. And with dramatically fast and cheap, I mean that even our non-optimized implementations have um, way below one second confirmation times, like final settlements. Um, I can send you money in something like Script and have final settlement with below one second, and that includes internet latency. Um, so it's dramatically fast. The second thing is dramatically cheap because we don't have to do any proof of work or anything like that. So we're doing a few signatures and we're doing uh, two database operations and that is it. So in, in a way it's relatively cheap to operate. So you can have um, tr transactions costs that are in the hundreds and thousands of a cent. So they're basically free. Uh, transactions within script are basically free. And the other thing is that it is truly anonymous and, and untraceable. So um, it is impossible to distinguish um, script payments from each other because the blind signature algorithm behind it basically means that your anonymity set is exactly as, long, uh, as big as all transactions that have been signed with the same key, which can be all transactions within a year or within whatever, it can be millions of transactions. And you cannot um, deduct anything from it. You cannot deduct um, information like which transaction came before another transaction. Uh, you, you cannot say what's the source of one transaction, what's the destination of a transaction, nothing like that is, is, um, is possible to deduct in, in a system like that. Um, what's the status of it? Um, as I said, it's mostly a research project for us. We have um, 
So working in SDK, uh, we have simulators for it and we have a full implementation of the protocol. Um, one thing to mention is that um, it's a multi-currency system. So we can uh, support billions and billions and billions of, of currencies in, in one system. And we're currently playing around with ideas of having something like smart contracts for, uh, for script. So that is the current um, research thinking. That is script. I, I got curious, it sounds kind of like we're both rev revolutionary and like amazing when you describe it, but since I, I'm not uh, even close to being as tech savvy as you, I just know that there's all, always like a devil's advocate type of side of every, any argument. So what are the weak points then of script? Like what, what, what's the biggest criticisms you've gotten? Like what are the things that are like, in your opinion, not as good? The weak point compared to cryptocurrencies is um, how much distribution you can get and how expensive distribution is. Um, so if you want a script system that is tuned for being very, very fast, then you cannot distribute it over thousands of nodes, but you have to distribute it over a few dozen nodes. And one could make the argument that that might be less trustworthy. Um, but the I wouldn't make that argument because I don't consider Sprit as a place where you hold your savings. It's more like you transform um, Bitcoin on chain into Sprit that you use for um, daily payments, for example. And then when your wallet is empty, you uh, reload it. And if your wallet is too full, you take it, uh, take some Bitcoin out. And in a way, you have you have your risk profile depending on how much money you're going to spend uh, per per day, or whatever um, period you want. So that is the the argument one could make. So it's 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 wrong to compare it to cryptocurrencies because it's not a currency; it's a payment system. It's a very different thing. So yeah, uh, other devil's advocates parts. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly believe that it's where digital payments should have gone to years ago. Sadly, there were a lot of patents that uh, prevented that. And by now, I actually think that it's not that interesting for, for the mass of people anymore um, because they'll, I don't know, central bank digital currencies plus uh, cryptocurrencies and they'll be happy. Because in the end, you know, nobody wants an extreme system like script anyways so yeah it sounds like a sort of privacy uh pro version of like the lightning network i mean that's me trying to really oversimplify it but um kind of because uh, as you're saying like the lightning network is often used like not many people are storing a million dollars on you know like <laughs> their, their, their lightning wallet or whatever so i guess that's how i'm thinking of it right like a alternative for those uh quick purchases in the store or whatever um yeah and then, Keep everything on chain or in your bank if you're using pounds or whatever. Yep. Um, okay, no, that's quite interesting. I wanted to take it back to the temporary autonomous zone, the task that you were talking about. Can you explain what that is and, and the idea behind it? Sure. Um, a, cu a couple of years ago, maybe a decade or something, um, I was very active in the laboratory scene and we had a good number of people locally in Berlin that were interested in freedom and went to weekly meetups and, and stuff like that. And I went to so many conferences and uh, all the Bitcoin stuff and, you know, everything was about liberty. There was a lot of discussion, but um, there was very little uh, action and there was very little um, of effect, uh, you know, things that, that would actually change the world. And, um, in a fundamental way, a way, change the world. And I think that with all the, you know, crypto anarchistic ideas, etc., one thing that none of these discussions ever touch is the freedom of the body, which is where all our freedoms um, originate from. So um, a lot of, well, a lot, a few of us got together and actually built this place um, where we declared it autonomous in the sense that, um, we would not allow any state interference in this place. 
and um, not use uh, state systems in their place, but build everything on the basis of um, a voluntary society in the sense of that you join the society voluntarily, you can exit it voluntarily and um, experiment with how to create those bubbles of freedom where, where you can do other things and escape the state. And um, it comes back a little bit to a little book I wrote a couple of years ago, uh, The Second Realm, um, which is about strategies that have historically worked in creating parallel societies. And in Berlin, the whole thing then looks like a couple of shipping containers, a fence, uh, security systems, and a couple of guys having a good time. I guess like as a, as a question, um, has the guys like the, the government or anything like that ever ever said anything or like have you had any run-ins or anything like that at all uh, you're not like kind of declaring yourselves a micronation to a degree are you so i guess it's not ultra public no no, 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 no. We're, we're not declaring ourselves a micronation um we're making a space where we have as little to do with the government as possible and uh, declaring yourself a micronation is a guarantee that you will have a lot to do with the government um it's not a we're not trying to, to make a dick move against the government. We just want to be free, you know? So, and that means that to a certain degree, it is based on hiddenness. Um, I mean, it's not really a secret that it, that it exists, but we're not running around and, and telling everybody uh, you can fuck the state here. Um, we're trying to not be in conflict with our neighbors. So just because we're free doesn't mean we have to piss off everybody. Um, it is also built on access control. So um, if we consider you an asshole, you won't have access because we have the freedom to determine um, how we're going to share our property and how we don't uh, share our property. Um, so, and lastly, it's, it's built on an, uh, an escalation strategy that will allow us, if we get into too much trouble with the state, to pack the whole thing up, disappear and reappear somewhere else. So those are the, um, the main principles on, on which it is built. We had a few run-ins, um, like we had issues with uh, the building department, which is okay. Uh, we had one murder investigation and one arson investigation, but they were unrelated to us. It, it's just a bad neighborhood. I was gonna say like I was like I was like what? Yeah, one from like zero to hundred. <laughs> oh, just like one with the housing department that murder and arson. <laughs> um, just a quick question. Sorry, Jerry. Um, have you ever had to kick any assholes out? And secondly, like if I'm visiting Berlin, can I just like you know drop me a message and be like, hey, dude, can I come visit and check it out and say hello to people? Um, did we ever kick people out? Yes, we did. Um, and. It's kind of actually part of the fun to, to kick people out. And the second question, uh, if you come to Berlin, can you chat me up and go to the place? Uh, yes, you may be. Um, it really depends on the person. You know, I mean, we're selective. You know, we're, we're, if you like you, yes, you can come. Um, we actually have public events there from time to time where we're uh, very little selective and actually publicly invite people. Um, but yeah, sure. But if you think that you're an asshole, then you're you're not welcome. And then you shouldn't come. That will hurt. Damn it. No, I'm just... would, would Lawrence be allowed? <laughs> well, he's just, he said maybe, right? We, we don't know each other well enough yet. I get it. That's cool. It seems I, like a cool idea. And, yeah. I, would, I would give you the benefit of the doubt. I thank, thank you very kindly. So my question is quite simple. Um, since you are a very ultra private person and I'm pretty sure you are um, privacy centric um, do you think as you mean that Bitcoin does not have total privacy on chain do you think that Bitcoin and Monero can coexist? I don't see a reason why they shouldn't be so it's okay money is a, is a little bit of a strange product but it's not really money what they're talking about so if we're talking about 
some things that we call currencies, but um, in reality, for most people, they're investment assets right now. And um, people can have a wide variety of assets and assets don't necessarily drive each other out. So there's no reason why Monero and Bitcoin can't coexist. And the, I think the, the main reason for Monero to keep existing is actually not that it's an investment uh, vehicle, but that it's one of the very few relatively private um, payment systems. So that, that makes Monero awesome. And uh, Bitcoin, well, it depends on who you ask. You know, the, the Bitcoin maxis will tell you that it's the only thing of any value because it's been there first and has the biggest hash power or whatever. And for other people, it's just a relic of the stone age of the cryptocurrencies. So we will see you about that. I wanted to ask you, do you see like a role for special economic zones or we hear a lot about, um, you know, people building like independent private cities based around Bitcoin mining. Uh, do you see that as like a possible future? I think that it's not just a possible future, but a necessary for the future. So, I mean, let's take Bitcoin out of the uh, equation there for a second, because I don't think it has too much to do with Bitcoin other than um, the increase of Bitcoin uh, price has allowed a lot of these projects. But the idea of smaller self-regulated territories is necessary for the future. And I think there's a reason for that. And the reason is this, um, the more complex the world becomes, uh, the more rules will be created, the more um, people fall under certain rules, the worse um, bad rules become. And if you um, think that to the end, it basically means is if you want the world to survive and thrive, you need uh, hundreds and thousands and maybe even millions of, of nations, um, or maybe nation is the wrong word, but jurisdictions or groups or whatever. Um, and if you want to kill the world, then create a world government. So we're going to settle somewhere in between. And as an anarchist, I'm, I mean, for me, it's like, I think the fundamental of, of, of freedom is really that you're, you're free to join whatever society you choose for yourself, as long as they want you as well. And that for me means uh, I want to see hundreds of thousands uh, of, of societies that coexist. And that will stabilize our future. It will stabilize humanity. It will create a lot of color. Uh, it will create uh, more conflict, but smaller conflict. Um, and it will make traveling so much more fun. Yeah, I could not agree with you more on a personal level um, there with, with what you've said. Uh, imagine the Olympics, though. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> with like 20,000 uh, know, communities, it'd no, be a the nightmare. The Olympics will, will be gone because... Uh, yeah. There won't be any state left where uh, people will agree to be raped by the Olympic Committee. True, true. Uh, but no payment for the Olympics anymore. I mean, sorry. Oh, maybe, damn. Maybe a little bit of Greece will have the Olympics like privately again. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't get to watch the long jump. But no, <laughs> yeah, no. But I agree. I, uh, not yeah. In a non, yeah, I was only messing around. Like, you but I do start, genuinely like, agree. Like you could start competing Olympics. That's just like based on merit, not nationality. Just like. Yeah, Com competence and jumping. Yeah, you could do, or like some other ideology maybe that would like put you into a group. Um, but yeah, I guess um, a question I wanted to ask because I um, saw about anarplex.net and um, so I checked out the website, but it'd be, it'd be cool like uh, to get an explanation of like, hey, you know, again, like similarly to Script Cash, like where, where did this come from? Like, where, what's the idea uh, and like how? I guess like what's what's up with it essentially like you know if anyone listening who has no idea you know say I'm someone who doesn't know much about tech in general like what what's what's the situation with the, that site like what's the inspiration behind it and why does it exist in the olden days of internet privacy there was um, an IRC uh, server that was hosted under the desk of a student somewhere in the Netherlands it was called the invisible IRC project and the Invisible RC project was one of those places where a lot of cypherpunks and uh, privacy researchers and cryptocurrency people and uh, criminals, whatever, hung around. So it was, it was actually one of the great communities of 
the internet um, and access to invisible RC was uh, very anonymous. Um, and it was a little bit of a laboratory, both for uh, playing around with rules, playing around with society, playing around with payment systems. So there are a couple of payment systems were created there. Um, a lot of ideas for privacy technology came from there, etc. So, and then um, the student finished uh, university, so he couldn't host a server anymore. So um, it happened that I was one of the, the people that took over that um, the server. And at that time, I also worked a lot in so-called IP darknets. So essentially, it's um, it's VPN-based darknets on top of the internet that allow you to interconnect computers in a very private way and um, communicate and, and whatever you do. And at some point, there were quite a lot of these relatively small groups that had their own um, networks like that and uh, ran stuff like virus sites or whatever. You know, you don't want to know what they actually did. So. And a lot of these uh, groups were relatively tight knit, but there was this, this constant question, hey, can't we just, you know, have something like uh, politics between those groups? You know, uh, yes, there are just networks on the internet, you know, but um, some of those networks want to um, share resources or want to communicate or whatever. So in a way, the, the whole idea of creating something like an internet exchange for darknets came up. And Anaplex ran uh, one of those uh, things where those, those networks would be able to, to connect, interconnect in a secure way and uh, deal with uh, traffic exchange, but also with conflict, um, manage their addressing and you know, everything that is, that is necessary if you run um, something like a virtual society on the internet, you know, say society of computers, basically. So um, that is the, the main thing it came from. And in that whole context, um, I then began to uh, collect writings that were related to the topic of uh, crypto tribes, files, alternative societies, etc., and collected them on Anaplex and contributed a few things myself. And that is where Anaplex comes from. So by now, it's 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 uh, a shade of its past, you know, um, it's, I don't know, it's uh, three darknets that are still interconnected over, over Anaplex. Uh, they're both not very, uh, all three not very big anymore. Um, and there's the IRC server, of course, still. Uh, there's a web forum. Um, there's a little bit of anonymous uh, messaging. So we're uh, operating a Redmond host um, and that's basically it. So by now it's a, it's a hobby project. It's not, I mean, I, I earned my money with it once. Uh, I don't do it anymore. So obviously it's, you know, it's a shell of its former self kind of thing, or it's at least decreased massively compared to what it was, as you say, like, you know, you once learned from it. Now it's a, a hobby thing. Um, why? Like, like, as in where have these people gone? I guess, where have these like different <laughs> tribes of people gone? Uh, I guess, yeah, it seems a simple question, but uh, yeah, you know, where, where, where are they, you know? It's actually not a simple question, and it's it's a question that um, has been asked a lot. So, uh, one of my friends, Paul Rosenberg, once jokingly said that he and I are the only crypto anarchists left on the planet, and then cryptocurrencies came, like Bitcoin came, and suddenly everybody was a crypto anarchist, um, except that it was only about uh, cryptocurrency and about and not about uh, everything else. So it's, it's really hard to say what, what exactly happened, but I think there's this, this, there was this phase in the late 90s and early 2000s when there was a lot of um, radical utopism going on. And it was, what was significant, uh, significant about those people was that they actually tried doing things like uh, each one of them. Uh, basically wanted to do something and they were very active and um, it was very community driven very co um, 
conversation driven, um, it there was this whole aspect of the digital gold currency, which was a uh, digital gold currencies, which was a relatively tight knit uh, group of people, large tight knit group of people um, that were involved with that, and when the crackdowns on that whole scene began, I think that a lot of people either disappeared out of fear or ended up in jail or um, got disillusioned. Um, and some of them probably just got too old. That's it. And then what you have is that you have this rotation in, in, in generations again. So it, it takes actually a really long time for similar kinds of density and intimacy to, to rebuild. So that doesn't work in like 10 years, you know, it's a, it's a thing that is, must be driven by, by the right individuals that inspire people and so on. And it's, it's, a, it's a rare thing. It, it has little to do with technology. It has a lot to do with the people that are involved. And um, yeah. What are your thoughts on, on our current uh, dark web, uh, like Tor and I2P that people are using for anonymity right now? It's better than nothing. Um, I'm a big fan of I2P, actually. Um, always have been um, much more of a fan of I2P than I've ever been of Tor. Um, though the technical differences are mar marginal and the, the threat models are marginal, the different. Um, I think the, the 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 biggest danger around both technologies is that they're considered for use cases outside of their, their threat model, um, that people don't really understand what the limits of those technologies are, and that because of that, those technologies often stand in the way of better technologies, and that we might run into the one or the other trap if we don't learn uh, how to select our technologies correctly. Another question I had was, do you have thoughts on, on MeshNet projects or, or projects like LoRaWAN as alternatives? <laughs> well, uh, alternative, um, it, I, I'm sorry, but I have to laugh about that uh, because it's not alternatives. If you uh, look at the, the bandwidth of current internet technology and compare it to any of those mesh networks, those are not equals. They're two uh, completely different things. Um, the, the one is Morse code and the other thing is, um, is a blast of bits, you know? So um, mesh networks are, because of their medium, are, are um, limited in their bandwidth. There's only so much bandwidth you can um, push through the air. And there's only so much bandwidth that you can push over distance through the air. And especially if you have to organize simultaneous access, that bandwidth becomes less and less. And then you have the issue that those mesh networks, if, if they want to be useful for anything, they have to have a, an extremely high density. You know, you have to have a lot of nodes in, in a very small area uh, for them to really make sense. And when I think that um, all the people that are interested in protecting their freedom with mesh networks, if they can make a density like that happen, I'm pretty sure that they can also overthrow every government. Um, you know, so it's, it's this, I simply don't believe in it as a replacement for the internet as we know it today, especially because the internet as we know it today is actually less bad than many people make it believe. And um, there are, like, if you want to go radical, there are more radical things to do that are much better. So I'll give you an example. In 2007, I think, um, I was in Panama. And one of the things that I did in Panama is I sat in a helicopter and spooled off um, 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 Lichtwell, um, fiber over the jungle from one settlement to the other. Uh, so it was basically a, a spool of fiber with uh, a steel cable. 
and um, it was uh, I don't know, four or five kilometers and we just put it on the trees. And um, if you look at my background picture here, um, what you see there is a subway tunnel. And on the sides of the subway tunnel, you see hundreds of uh, pipes and cables. If you're in a city, your best bet on replacing the internet is taking over the subway tunnels and the sewers and putting fiber in them. So that is how you actually do it. Uh, so I'm, I'm very critical in, in what the goal of mesh networks uh, shall be other than, uh, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know what, what people want with that. Seriously, sorry. One last question. Um... I'm sure you'd agree, agree with me that um, the, the, the level of awareness you know, around privacy among most of the population is very low. And um, why do you think you know, that you know, is the case? Why do we not see more people you know, aware or you know, having worried about their OPSEC, you know, you know, what kind of information that they put out there and you know, the usage of you know, privacy tools? Um, I think... That is one of the uh, really sad questions you can ask these days. But um, I think there, there are a lot of answers to that that all um, ring a little bit of truth to me. Um, I think that a large part of the answer is because people are lazy sheep. And um, they don't want to believe in things that would force them to take action. Uh, because it makes them feel uncomfortable and insecure and whatever. So it's so much easier to believe that the state will protect you against every evil in the world. You know, it's, that's a nice life. You know, you can always say the state will protect me, the state will protect me. And if the state fails in protecting me, I can sue. And I think that is uh, how a lot of people live in the world today. We, we delegated so many of our decisions and concerns and everything to the state. You know, it's like, I mean, there are people that, that, that think that um, everything should come from the state, you know, like food and, and water and energy and everything, you know? So the state is the big thing that keeps me alive, why shouldn't he also keep me private? So that, I think that is one thing. The other thing is that I think that a lot of people don't understand what uh, privacy in the digital age means. Um, they don't know what the dangers of not being private are. And when they understand it, it will be too late if they ever understand it. And then there's the third thing, and that is, I think that we're experiencing a cultural shift in the sense of how people view themselves and others. And I think part of this cultural shift is that privacy is not a value anymore, but actually something negative to a certain degree. Um, so I use this example a lot, you know, I mean, try to date a girl uh, without having a social media presence, you know. Um, you'll not be very successful because they think that you're a serial killer, you know, because otherwise you would have a social media presence. So um, it's this expectation of sharing and transparency, etc., that we often rough, often think is our is something like a moral something like a moral uh, necessity. I think that is that is. What is happening today? What are your thoughts on El Salvador's uh, Bitcoin legal tender, though? I think it's terrible. I think it's like, um, like what the fuck? You know, we were talking about cyberpunk and cypherpunk, you know, and liberty and whatever. And now you have a government that forces people to accept something for the payment of, of debt that they wouldn't um, want to accept um, voluntarily before. And I think that those people that applaud the government for forcing people to accept uh, Bitcoin as payment and payment of debt um, and claim to be libertarians are just stupid assholes. I'm sorry. I think it's a terrible idea. No, dude, like I, I, I totally get I, I get where you're coming from there because... Um... There's that like uh, there's a thing where I remember when when it first happened I thought oh, this is really cool and then um, I noticed how quickly the law was actually getting made and put into practice 
And I was like, well, hold up. This seems like, you know, how in communist China, everything happens ultra quick and really impressively. And then, you know, oh, the reason why is because it's an extremely restrictive state with like, you know, horribly scary Orwellian laws and practices. Uh, and so then you kind of think, oh, is that the case here? And then you kind of look at Bukele and, and kind of what he's up to and you think, oh, okay. So um, even if it weren't, you know, it's like, are you really telling me that it's a great idea that, you know, Bitcoin, which had this, came from this context, you know, of, uh, or at the time, you know, when we had like stuff like Occupy Wall Street, when we had like financial crisis, when we had like, let's escape the state, you know, and now you're invested in Bitcoin and you're praising any government, no matter how tame it is, you know, for, for making your, your Bitcoin more valuable because they're uh, captive customers now, you know, by, by legal tender. I mean, seriously, this, I mean, I, I find this, um, it, is, it is the betrayal of anything that it was in the beginning. And it's okay, you know, I, I understand that because we have betrayed everything around it for 10 years. Why not finish it off with uh, something like that? You mentioned that um, we've betrayed Bitcoin for the past, you know, for the last decade. And I'm trying to understand, are you trying to say that, you know, Bitcoin's, um, Bitcoin's you know, value proposition is, is failing in your opinion or it's not living up to your expectation? No, no, no. Um, number one, I, I, I actually think that... Um, the word value proposition actually is part of the betrayal. So, um, so the whole system began uh, with with a white paper about you know permissionless digital cash. You know that that is what we were doing, and um, then it became hodl. You know, don't spend it, don't use it as cash. You know, hodl, um, and then it became. Oh yeah, let's make others accept it as well, you know, so the price goes up. This whole thing has so little to do with freedom and liberation anymore. It has, in my view, almost everything to do with making a few people rich, you know, and that's it. You know, and, and that is sad as shit. You know, if I when I remember, you know, there were there were times where I would sit in a cafe and swap some euros for bitcoin and the dude who bought them would go on silk road with it you know get a hit be happy you know that was that was honest you know everybody knew what was going on you know people paid with it they were liberated new new businesses existed you know hey i don't need a bank account anymore i can accept it directly the number of of big players that accept bitcoin is actually going down you know, because it is huddled. It is just an asset anymore. It's not the liberation of payments anymore. And that is, uh, that is an issue. That is an issue. And, you know, all these, yeah, we have to get invest, um, institutional investors into it and we have to make governments accept it and whatever. It's like, no, that's not liberation. That's sucking the dick of Wall Street. And now it's just because it's your dick as well that makes it good? No, it's not. You know, so I'm, no, it's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a punk at heart, you know, and for me, the liberating aspects of it are the important ones. And I don't give a shit if somebody makes a Lambo or two out of it, you know, I don't. I think, I think it's, I, I, for me, I, I find out, you know, hard to accept because at some point it has to be a compromise because if you believe in Bitcoin, you have to, you know, believe that at some point that it'll have to get bigger. So how big is big enough? Why do you have to believe that it's going to have to be bigger? I don't understand that. So if it, if it um, accomplishes a, a liberating function, like being able to make payments without banks, then how, how much bigger does it have to become? You know, it's already a big thing, you know, and... Yes, if as many people as possible can participate in something like that, that's a great thing. But it's not about making it more valuable in the sense of driving up the price, forcing people to accept it, etc. So my, 
it's the same thing, you know, institutional investors. How does inviting institutional investors make anything better about Bitcoin? The only thing it does, it, it invites regulation. You know, it invites um, the SEC and everybody else to make sure that those institutional investors can safely invest. And that means that we, you and I, have to bow down for that so it's safe for the suits. No, it's, that's, I'm sorry, it's, it's for what? You know, just because it's cool technology? No, that's not enough. I want liberty. I don't care really about the rest. You know, I want liberty. Fair point. Hey, man, I, um, yeah, I say uh, we'll, we'll wrap up because it's been about an hour, but um, yeah, it's been awesome to have you on. It's um, it's kind of refreshing as well to like have your your views on the Bitcoin and the El Salvador situation. Um, I feel like uh, you've been extremely honest with us, which is uh, much appreciated. Um, and I definitely can see a lot of your points as well, actually. Um, there's a lot of times where I think, you know, uh, a lot of like Bitcoin spokesmen like uh, Pomp and Michael Saylor and stuff. And it's like, don't think they're uh, crypto punks by any stretch of the imagination or kind of anywhere close to what um, Bitcoin and its uh, you know, believers uh, ha has been you know, for the past decade or whatever. So, um, yeah, I kind of I, I can definitely see the, the space shifting from uh, liberation and uh, freedom of uh, finance i guess um to kind of this hey you know if el salvador accepts it and it, you know i think a lot, i think a lot of people who are in bitcoin now would be super duper happy if their bitcoin just became worth millions and millions and millions and millions sure. of dollars um even if it's this like state state pushed thing and so i, I definitely see your point 100 uh, um so yeah i appreciate you coming on it's been awesome to have you um yeah, well, uh, you know, if you want to give any details of uh, your podcast that you, you you have, like how people can find that and find you on the podcast, that'd be that'd be awesome. Um, but before you do so, I'll just say thanks everyone for tuning in. And um, but yeah, please go ahead and and, and say that. Um, you can find the podcast Cypherpunk Bitstream on pretty much every platform or on taz number zero dot org. Taz zero dot org. Taz zero dot org. Well, yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks, uh, Ricardo, Jerry, Michelle for joining us. Um, and everyone out there have amazing uh, morning, afternoon, evening, day, week, year. Uh, lots of love, and um, we'll see you all soon. The classy crypto universe. <laughs>